do to where this chair is. The people have more. Okay. Okay. All right. Over there, so and good afternoon. Put it, move that chair and put her so we can see. Because she's taller than that. She's got a big head. Okay. And she's in the wheel of right though. Okay. You know. All right. We all all right set now. Okay. Okay. Can you see back there? Yes. Okay. My name is Evan Weiner. My background is mostly radio, mostly newspapers, but I've also been on TV. And I have an uh, interest in the early days of TV. And some of you might remember this guy, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. Yes. Uh, on Dumont. And the Dumont Network. Now, today, there are hundreds upon, well, 60 networks when you talk about cable TV and streaming and, and the big four, which would be ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Back in the day when network TV started in 1946 in the United States, it was the Dumont Network that was number one, beating out CBS and NBC. And they started on September 15, 1946. By uh, who? Any soap opera fans here? We had a Dumont. You had a Dumont TV. We, yep, we I had did. ten inches. Ten okay. inches. There were sixteen and everybody inches. Everybody was crowded together. They looked, looked, and looked. Uh, well, what happened to Dumont? Well, that's a good question because Alf, uh, Alfred Dumont, Alfred uh, B. Dumont. Uh, decided that the way to sell more TVs was to have a network. And people would buy Dumont TVs to watch Dumont and NBC and CBS. Dumont, the network, goes out of business eventually, and so does the Dumont TV. Uh, October 2nd, the first network soap opera starts uh, 1946 on Dumont. It's called Faraway Hill. Uh, Ted Mack's original amateur hour. That was on uh, Dumont, along with the Maury Amsterdam show. Remember Maury Amsterdam? On the Dick Van Dyke show. Carl Reiner wrote the Dick Van Dyke show. The uh, character, Buddy Sorrell, that was played by Maury Amsterdam, was based on Mel Brooks. Captain Video and his Video Rangers. You're, did you ever watch it with a helmet on? No. I've had two people over the years tell me, one woman, one man, say, I used to watch it with the helmet on. The woman said to me, up in Stanford, her father bought her the helmet. The guy in New Jersey had no idea who bought him the helmet, but they used to watch with the uh, helmet on Captain Video and his Video Rangers. Arthur Murray Dance Party. Anybody watch that? Uh -huh. Arthur Murray. What did you say? Arthur Murray. No. That, I never saw anyone with a helmet on. Yeah, oh yeah, they got helmets that watched Captain Video. Uh, they were toy helmets, but their parents got it for them in one case. And, and a woman and the man said he had no idea where how he got it. Arthur Murray Dance Party, there's an Arthur Murray that opened up on Route 22 in Scarsdale. Remember this guy, Ernie Kovacs? Uh -huh. Did you like him? Yeah, that's a Perry Como. Oh, well, no, that's Ernie Kovacs right there. Kovacs. Kovacs. He was the uh, only guy, he was one of the few guys who were on all four networks, Dumont, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Uh, he was uh, one of six shows that were broadcast on all four networks during the golden age of TV. The others, the original Amateur Hour, Ted Mack, Pantomime Quiz, I don't know if you remember that, Down You Go, the Arthur Murray Dance Party, and Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. And there's Captain Video, a uh, picture of that. It's a real cheesy set. Captain Video's set was probably as flimsy as a box of cardboard, but they made it look like it was real. Uh, do not look for unknown talent. Unlike CBS and NBC, CBS could always dip into the radio network and get Lucille Ball or Jack Benny. Uh, NBC had Sid Caesar, uh, CBS had uh, Ed Sullivan as well, um, and Milton Berle on NBC. So Dumont was looking for unknown talent, and they did find unknown talent. And in many ways, Dumont was a cutting-edge television network. Uh, here's one of their shows, Rocky King, Private Eye. Dumont, well, before, how many of you remember Howdy Doody? 
<laughs> yeah, well, before Howdy Doody, there was Big Brother Bob Emery on the Dumont Network with the Small Fry Club. Uh, how many of you watched uh, Angela Lansbury, Murder, She Wrote? Oh, yes. Okay, well, before that, there was the gallery of Madame Lee Song, uh, who started her career in 1922 in uh, silent movies, uh, Asian, first Asian-American actress. Uh, Dumont was pioneering in many ways, uh, in a pie, and, and they were looking at getting minority audiences by featuring minority performers at a time when other networks uh, aired few shows for non-whites. Among the uh, minority programming on Dumont, the gallery of Madame Lee Song, starring the Asian-American actress Anna Mae Wong, uh, the first TV show to feature an Asian-American, and the Hazel Scott Show. How many of you remember Hazel Scott? Great piano player, Hazel right? Scott. Hazel Scott, tremendous piano player. Well. Uh, she had the uh, first U.S. TV series hosted by a black woman back in 1950. It was short-lived. She was accused of being a communist because she played the piano at the Cafe Society in Greenwich Village. She was no communist. I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, they had the first network news uh, out of Washington, Dumont Television Network, the nation's window on the world. Uh, the first news was a guy by the name of Walter Compton. Walter Compton News, June 1947 to 1948, moving from WTTG in Washington, which was Channel 5, to the network on uh, August 25th, 1947, and then INS, Tell News, Camera Headlines, January 1948 to 1949. Well, they had a variety show with an unknown actor, Jackie Gleason, The Cavalcade of Stars, which was a bunch of skits which included The Honeymooners. Um, and it was on the Dumont Network that uh, Ralph Crampton first said, one of these days, Alice, to the moon. one of these days, bang, zoom to the moon. And Orchard Meadows playing Alice is saying, yeah, I want to see you send me to the moon. Uh, it was on the Cavalcade of Stars that Ralph Crampton debuted. Uh, it was his Ralph first, ja yeah, Jackie Gleason's first, first uh, television series was on the Dumont Network. Uh, and Gleason uh, had filled in for William Bendix on The Life of Riley. Yeah. And uh, he starts yeah. hosting uh, the Cavalcade of Stars on July 13th, 1950, immediate sensation. So you got Cavalcade of Stars on, you have the Hazel Scott Show on, also in 1950. Hazel Scott Show lasted about two and a half months because she was added in red channels as a communist sympathizer. And she decides to go before the House of Un-American Activities, I'll get you one second, in September of 1950 to say, I'm no communist. But Dumont said, we don't like this, you're God. Sponsors say, you're God. And the Hazel Scott show lasted about three months because she was falsely accused of being a communist. She had something to say? I was going to ask you, I went to Radio City. Yeah, NBC. I Hazel Scott played the organ at Radio City. Oh, okay. Is that the same Radio City? Hazel Scott, the same one. Same one. Uh, Dumont also had Saturday Night Football. Monday Night Football came on with a great fanfare uh, on ABC in 1970, but Dumont had the original NFL nightly TV contract. On December 23, 1951, Dumont televised the first live coast-to-coast uh, -coast professional football game. They got AT&T to uh, allow them to use the AT&T lines. Uh, it was a game between the Los Angeles Rams and the Cleveland Browns, and Dumont paid $75,000 to do that sh uh, show. 1953-54, Dumont broadcast Saturday night NFL games, the first time NFL games were televised coast to coast in prime time for an entire season. Dumont had Jackie Gleason before CBS, Bishop Sheen before ABC, the original Amateur Hour before NBC. Dumont, you had the TVs. Were they good TVs, the yes. Dumont TVs? 
I had one too. You had one. Yes. I and they one. looked, they were cathedral-like, right? Mm -hmm. They were solid pieces of yes. furniture. Mm -hmm. They weren't just the TV. Yes. They had a lot of other things inside the TV. Uh, it was a manufacturer of high-quality television sets and equipment, but unfortunately, most people today, and very few people actually saw Dumont shows, but most people today who do remember Dumont said, well, it was a purveyor of low-budget programming. Yeah, that's true, but so was CBS, so was ABC, so was NBC. The end is near, WDTV uh, in uh, Detroit, one of the Dumont cameras. Dumont struggled, and some of it was their own fault, some of it was out of their control. Combination of intense competition, lack of resources that other networks uh, had from diverse interests in radio and uh, ever-shifting FCC regulations uh, hurt the company's cash flow. They just weren't getting money. AT&T would only allow Dumont to broadcast 37 hours weekly primetime uh, content along its coaxial cable lines. The, this is coaxial cable right here. Uh, whereas uh, NBC and CBS, they got 100 hours. The last non-sports programming on Dumont was a game show called What's the Story? And that aired on September 23rd, 1955. And that was it for the Dumont Network. Dumont's shows were caught on Kinescope. Kinescope, the best way I can tell you is you put a camera right here and you shoot it at the screen. And then you record it and then you cycle it out to stations. Uh, the Kinescopes were thrown out until the 1970s. Dumont's shows, a lot of them, were stored in a warehouse somewhere in the Bronx. The actress, Edie Adams, you remember Edie Adams? She was married to Bernie Kovacs. Yeah. Testified in 1996 before a panel of the Library of Congress uh, on, the, uh, on keeping television and video. She said, so little value was given to these films that the stored kinescopes were loaded into three trucks and dumped into Upper New York Bay. If somehow you can go down there and find your kinescopes, put them through a process, you, and you might be able to find the old Dumont shows. Meanwhile, the longest running show on American TV is a show some of you might watch called Meet the Press. Yeah, you can watch Meet the Press. started on November 6, 1947. And this woman, Martha Roundtree, is the creator of Meet the Press. And I have one thing in common with Martha Roundtree. She worked at Mutual Radio in the 1940s, and I worked at Mutual Radio before it went out of business in the 1980s. She is the originator of Meet the Press. She is also the first woman moderator of Meet the Press and the last woman moderator of Meet the Press. Oh. Follow, the, the, the following people are supposed to Meet the Press. Lawrence Feedback. Uh, Tim Russert, David Gregory, and uh, Chuck Todd. That's it. No woman has hosted Meet the Press since she left Meet the Press in the 1950s. Who is she? Uh, he, what? Who is she? She was a journalist. Uh, she, did, uh, she took the show from radio to TV. She created the show in 1945, uh, got to TV in 1947. Uh, her partner was a guy by the name of Lawrence Spivak. They got into fights. She left the show, and she did some news over at the Dumont Network. Um, this guy here is Bob Block. He just passed away last year at the age of 94. That's me, and that's uh, Frank Carney. Frank Carney worked for uh, the guy who, one of the people who originated cable TV, a guy by the name of John Walson. Bob Block was friends with Henny Youngman. How many of you remember Henny Youngman? Take my wife, please, yeah. right? Yeah. They were good friends. Bob Block, among other things, owned a comedy club in Milwaukee. And uh, two of his best friends were uh, Maury Amsterdam and Henny Youngman. And he tells me one day, we're talking about Henny Youngman, and he says, you know, he died a bitter man. I said, why? Well, he thought he should have been Mr. Television. Bob Block's friend, Henny Youngman. Oh, Prince, uh, Princess. Queen Elizabeth passed away yesterday, and this story includes Princess Elizabeth back in 1947. 44,000 television sets were in usage in 1947. Henny Youngman, native of Liverpool, England, Henny Youngman, 
is offer the chance for a new TV show uh, to host it anyway. It's called the Texaco Star Theater. How many of you watched the Texaco Star Theater back in the day? Okay. Hedy Youngman is offered the chance to host the show. But he's also committed to a royal performance in London before Princess Elizabeth and, uh, and the whole royal family back then. And this causes a conflict. Bob is telling me that uh, Henny told him that his agent said, listen, Henny, I'm not going to make the decision for you. You have to make the decision. Now, I am going to put you in Henny Youngman's shoes for a second. If somebody came up to you and said, Henny, you got this thing booked. You are from England after all, but you got this thing booked. The Princess Elizabeth is going to be there. Other members of the royal family are going to be there. Maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But they also want you the same day to do this TV show, and there are only 44,000 televisions in use in 1947. So let me ask you, if you're Henny Youngman, do you do the show that features Princess Elizabeth, or do you do the television show with virtually no people watching you? What, is your, what would you do? What would you do? You, st you would stay with the royal family. How many would you stay with the royal family? Okay, how many of you would put your, you know, take a risk on television where nobody's watching it? None. Well, guess what Henny did? Henny decided, well, you know what? I'm going to do the royal family. You can trust your car to the man who wears the star, the big, bright, Rex Texaco star, right? This is the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, so Henny's unavailable. And they call this guy, actor, comedian, uh, you might have heard of him, Milton Berle? Milton Berle, Uncle Milty. He's doing the show. And Henny Youngman regretted doing the royal show because he thought, he thought he could have gotten the show. And Berle lasted on the show for eight years. Uh, Texaco Star Theater, largely create, uh, credited with driving American television set sales. The number of TV sets sold during the run, which was eight years, grew from 500,000 to 30 million by the time the show ended in 1956. Now, not everybody bought the TV to see Milton Berle, but a lot of people did. In fact, businesses would close on Tuesday night. They put a sign up, went home to watch Milton Berle. See you tomorrow. How many of you watch Milton Berle? Texaco Star Theater, the highest rated television show, 1950-51. The first season, the Nielsen ratings were used. But there were very few TVs in the United States. There were only four TV stations west of the Mississippi. Most of the TVs, quarter of the TVs were in the New York City area at that time. How many of you remember uh, this guy? Uh -huh. Jerry Stiller was my cousin. And Jerry and Ann, Ann Mirror, were on the show about three dozen times. Mm -hmm. And when you saw Ed doing that, he's watching the time because he wants to get the commercials in. Uh, I'll give you a story that Jerry gave me. Uh, remember Anna Marie Albergetti? Yeah. The yeah. singer? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, every Sunday night, Broadway is dark. So Ed would have something for everybody. He'd have something for the little kids, the teenagers, young adults, the adults with young children. Uh, empty nesters and senior citizens. And one of the things that he would have on Sunday, because Broadway was dark, would be actors and actresses coming from Broadway doing musicals and singing a number or two from the musical. So uh, one weekend, one Sunday night, he has Anna Marie Albergetti on the show. Jerry's telling the story. He says Anna Marie Albergetti is singing whatever song she's singing from Broadway. And the people are they weren't too enthused. So Ed gets up there and says, Come on, come on, come on, let's hear it, let's hear it, come on, let's hear it, let's hear it. Let's hear it from Ava Maria. <laughs> he thought Anna Maria Albergetti was Ava Maria. Anyway, the Toast of the Town debuts June 20th, 1948. Every Sunday at 8 o'clock, a man who couldn't sing, couldn't dance, couldn't spin plates. I love plate spinners, they were great. I speak on cruise ships. I've seen plate spinners on cruise ships 
where the cruise ships are going like that. They're really good. His name, Ed Sullivan, and he was as much of a celebrity as the acts that appeared on the show. Ed Sullivan was pasty in the bright lights, shifty in his stance, bungled introductions and monologues like uh, Anna Maria Albregetti. Yet, he was great. Here's Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin, Toast to the Town. They were on the show, the first show when it started uh, on CBS called Toast to the Town, and that was during the height of the Martin and Lewis craze. Um, first program, Solomon had Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, <coughs> Rogers and Hammerstein, a pianist, a ballerina, a troupe of crooning firemen, crooning firemen, singing firemen, a boxing referee whose next gig was the Joe Lewis, Jersey Joe Walcott match. He had something for everyone. 1950, NBC decides we're going to put up a show that we think is going to do rather well against Sullivan. It's called the Colgate Comedy Hour. Among others who are hosting the show, Abbott Costello in Chicago, Martin and Lewis in Los Angeles, and Eddie Cantor in New York. You remember Eddie Cantor? The height of his career was around 1933, 1934. He was well past his prime by 1950. Yet, there he is. Uh, singing Making Whoopi or A Few New Susie or uh, the uh, theme song for uh, the Bugs Bunny cartoons, uh, Merrily We Roll Along. And there's Martin and Lewis back in the day and Abbott and Costello. Dur this show is a modern miracle in 1950. I was giving a talk in Teaneck, New Jersey one day and there was an old television engineer there who started to explain this to me. And I said, hey listen, I'm talented. I'm the uh, last to know and the first to go. Uh, I know nothing about technology. But anyway, during 1950-51, AT&T started a coast-to-coast, -coast, coaxial, microwave uh, interconnection service, which allowed live telecasts from each coast. The production units were set up in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. The show got talent, but at the end of the day, Ed Sullivan would beat them. The comics of those days, all men, these are the people on TV, Jerry Lester, Martin and Lewis, Jack Benny, Jimmy Durante, Milton Berle. Oh, Lucille Ball is on too as well, but uh, she isn't a big enough star to get on the cover of TV Guide. Howdy Doody. How many of you watched or your kids watched Howdy Doody? Yeah, Bob, Buffalo Bob Smith well, actually lived in Scarsdale. And you couldn't miss his house in Scarsdale. Why? It had a big totem pole in front of it. Had kids there all the time. You could also catch Buffalo Bob Smith in New Rochelle. Why? He had a liquor store in New Rochelle. Uh, so anyway, uh, there's Howdy Doody and Buffalo Bob Smith. That show began December 27, 1947. It lasted until 1960. Oh, it's the first kid show ever shown in color. Why? Well, you have kids, right? And when kids see something new that they want, what do they say? I want a color TV. I want a color TV. I want a color TV. Because of that. And NBC is owned by RCA. And they make TVs, right? Uh, anyway, uh, although most parents got the old green screen that they threw up against the TV screen, how many of you had that? And it kind of gave you some color. I had that when I was about three years old. Uh, that would be 1959. Uh, initially, it was on every day, 5 o'clock Eastern time. Oh, Bob Keeshan was Clarabelle. He left the show to become Captain Kangaroo. Mm -hmm. yes. I Love Lucy. I do a 60-minute talk on I Love Lucy, so this is about a three-minute version of the talk. I Love Lucy debuted in 1951. Uh, Desi Lu Productions formed by Desi and Lucy specifically to go on tour around the United States because there was a problem with Lucy and Desi's marriage. They were an interracial couple. And in 17 states at that time in the United States, interracial marriage was illegal. And so they were going out there to show the world that they were a legitimately married couple. They were married in California and they could work together. The Lucy Show started in 1951. Mm -hmm. There was the pregnancy dilemma. Remember, 1952 America was considered obscene and immoral for a woman to be pregnant on TV. 
right? They, you know, even though she was married to Desi, right? Uh, Lucille Ball is pregnant, but you cannot say pregnant on TV. Mm. CBS censors denied the word pregnancy to be, or said uh, the word pregnancy was uh, too obscene, even in the context of married characters who happen to be married. Uh, TV uh, parents typically were shown under the covers in separate beds. Uh, Desi and Lucy almost ended the show before the second season because she was pregnant and nobody ever saw a pregnant woman before, right? You never saw a pregnant woman. Anybody ever see a pregnant woman? Nah, you never saw her. At least on TV. So they were thinking of ending the show. But there was a pregnant woman on TV. Her name was Mary Kay Stearns. It was the Mary Kay and Johnny show, 1948 on the Dumont Network. Problem is, nobody saw the show. Then they moved it over to NBC and she was no longer pregnant, but the baby she gave birth to became an actor on the show. And then it moved to CBS and it was gone by 1950. Lucy wore pants. Women were not allowed to wear pants on TV in the 1940s and 50s. It would take until 1961, 60 years ago, that women were allowed to wear capri pants on TV like Mary Tyler Moore. Mary Tyler Moore said, I had Laura wear pants because I said, women don't wear full skirted dresses to vacuum it. You know, uh, she said, CBS said, you know, we're a little afraid that housewives are going to be a little annoyed because she looks so good in pants. So they made Carl Reiner, the show's creator, promise not to let me wear pants in more than one scene. We went along with that for three episodes, and then finally I just started wearing pants. Lucy, a pioneer TV show, for, uh, featured the first intermarried couple, uh, interracial couple on TV. Uh, the show, out of necessities, created the rerun industry. And Desi and Lucy were TV's first millionaires because of reruns. Uh, Jack Benny is one of the radio stars who moved to TV. I'm not a big fan of the Jack Benny TV shows. I love the Jack Benny radio shows because radio is the theater of the imagination and you can imagine anything you want listening to radio. TV, well, he's not 39 years old. They are older. They are older. Jack was uh, 56 when he started the show on TV. Rochester is older. Everybody is older. I mean, they, you can't conjure up things. And they took a lot of scripts and brought them over to TV, but uh, it doesn't work as well as radio. Radio was spontaneous. This wasn't. Uh, Groucho, now he moved his show from radio to TV, and uh, You Bet Your Life was great on TV. Why? Because it was just a forum for Groucho to sit there and ad lip or wisecracks. Uh, maybe this happened, maybe this didn't. This is a you bet your life. Groucho said it happened, and some people said it didn't happen, and Groucho said, well, it didn't happen, but it happened. Anyway, Marion and Charlotte's story had 20 children. When Groucho asked why she had chosen to raise such a large family, Mrs. Story is said to have replied, I love my husband. To which Marx responded, I love my cigar, but I take it out of my mouth every once in a while. <laughs> oh, you got the joke, huh? <laughs> you got the joke. I had to, about six years ago, there was a married couple sitting in front of me. I see her going like that. What's he mean by that? What's he mean by that? And the husband says, I'll tell you afterwards. I said, if you tell her, tell me too, because I don't know. <laughs> Dagmar! <laughs> Dagmar! Dagmar. I was doing a talk about seven, eight years ago, and I put up a picture of Dagmar, and there's a 90-year-old guy, who all of a sudden is panting. <gasps> <gasps> I, said, What's I said, are you okay? What's the problem? Uh, no, I'm okay. You sure you're okay? Because I'll call somebody in and make sure. No, I'm okay. The best breather on TV. He used to watch her just to breathe. Uh, Dagmar, Broadway Open House. The template of The Tonight Show, even though there was a late night show starting in 1949 with Faye Emerson, first woman. Yeah. First woman to host a late night talk show was not Joan Rivers, but Faye Emerson, 1946. Yeah. Sylvester Pat Weaver, the uh, father of Sigourney Weaver, creates Broadway Open House for NBC. Starts in May 1950, 
Jerry Lester and Maury Amsterdam were the hosts. Maury left the show, leaving Lester. A tall, buxom blonde, one-time sweater model by the name of Jenny Lewis, where Dagmar becomes TV's first sex symbol. The blonde before Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she did leave a lasting impression. Um, these are called the Dagmar Bumpers. Harley Earl was the uh, General Motors uh, engineer. And uh, he decides for whatever reason to put what looked like artillery shells on the front of bumpers on General Motors cars, which went over real well with World War II vets who were trying to forget uh, artillery shells, right? So they became known as the Dagmar Bumpers, probably because of this. Uh, and they're to this day known as the Dagmar Bumpers among old car buffs. And uh, they changed the bumpers and they put a little black thing on the bumpers. This is uh, 1957 Chevy that I saw last February, and they ended up looking like pasties. Car designs, right? Bum, ba bum, 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 ba bum, bum, bum. Story you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the yeah. innocent. Dragnet, badge number 714. Started in 1951, lasted eight years. It was enduring. There was a second version in color. Uh, returned in 1967, ended in 1970. And there was supposed to be a third version, but Jack Webb died of a heart attack in the 1980s. It had high ratings, a recognizable theme song, and this guy, Sergeant Joe Friday. The, fa the facts, man, just the facts. Today Show, anybody still watching the Today Show? Today, you watch it today? Has it changed? It's the same show it was when it debuted 70 years ago in January. The only things that have changed are the faces. Like Dave Garraway isn't around anymore, but J. Fred Muggs is. He's living in Tampa, living the life of a content chip. A uh, chip. Uh, it debuted on January 14, 1952. Today, blended national news, headlines, interviews with newsmakers, lifestyle features, other light news and gimmicks, and local news updates from the network stations. The only difference today from 1952, I think it's on four hours a day now instead of two hours a day. Oh, here's an ad. Here's an ad. Motorola. How many, anybody own a Motorola TV? I guess so. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. How television benefits your children. Uh, and basically it says that uh, your children uh, will be better citizens if you watch TV. Motorola, leader in television, shows how TV can mean better behavior at home and better marks in school. How does TV watching uh, Dennis the Menace give you better marks in school? You ever figure that one out? But that was uh, an ad. Oh, speaking of better marks in school, national education television, and some of you probably watch Channel 13 in New York. All right. Uh, National Education TV, or NAT, operated from May 16, 1954 to October 4, 1970. It was owned by the Ford Foundation, the family of Henry Ford, and later co-owned by the Corpora Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The network was founded as the uh, Educational Television and Radio Center in November 1952 by a grant from the Ford Foundation's Fund for Adult Education. Initially, local stations, uh, educational stations, made shows, and it was basically a clearinghouse. You give us that show, uh, we'll send it there, and whoever's out there will send it to uh, your television station. Uh, didn't produce any material. The company would move to New York from Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1958. Uh, romper Room, Romper, Bobber, Stomper, Boo, Tell Me, Tell Me, Tell Me Who, and that's all I know. Because I couldn't watch Romper Room. I really couldn't watch Romper Room. Uh, but anyway, uh, Romper Room, some of your kids might have watched it, right? Any, any of your kids watch Romper Room? Yeah. Uh, this one is with Miss Joan, WTVR TV, Channel 6. Uh, Romper Room was a television show that was franchised and syndicated from 1953 to 1954. 
It was created by Bert Claster. His wife was the presenter, Nancy Claster of Claster Television. Each program opened with greetings from the hostess and then the Pledge of Allegiance. How many of you remember the Steve Allen show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You liked it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here's Don Knotts, Louis Nye, Tom Poston, and Steve Allen. Man on the Street was a popular feature on the show, featured Don Knotts as the nervous Mr. Morrison. Tom Poston uh, as the man who couldn't remember his own name. Pat Harrington as an Italian golf player, Guido Panzini. Louis Nye, the smug Gordon Hathaway, and Bill Dana as Jose Jimenez. Shelley, put down the burner phone. I know your ears are burning because I mentioned Bill Dana. My friend Shelley Saltman uh, knew Bill Dana, or the, the, I believe the name was the uh, Swarthmarter family. And uh, Bill Dana's brother was a doctor at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, Bill Dana went on to a career basically known as Jose Jimenez. The Taming of Elvis was on the Steve Allen Sunday Night Show. Uh, on July 1st, 1956, Steve Allen presented Elvis Presley with a top hat, white tails, uh, as a high-class musician while singing Hound Dog to an actual Basset Hound who was dressed the same way. Hey, how many of you are upset that Elvis did this? Anybody upset that Elvis did that? Yeah. A nation was upset. 1956, he did it on the Milton Berle show in June of 1956, and all the columnists decided to come right down on him, and he was obscene, and Ed Sullivan said, I'd never have him on my show. He did three times because Ed liked money. Um, you know, his gyrations caused a, a national discussion of morality. All he did was this. Anyway, Jack Parr. How many of you remember Jack Parr? Jack Parr show. You like him? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How many times was he on that show before walking off? Seemingly walking off. Mm -hmm. With the success of Steve Allen as the first host of the Tonight Show, he got his own primetime show, June 1956, on Sunday night, and Sullivan crushed him except for one show where Steve Allen had Elvis on. Over the next seven months, Allen's uh, Tonight Duties uh, were limited to three nights a week. Ernie Kovacs was the host on Monday and Tuesday night. Uh, with the heavy workload and his new show being somewhat successful, Steve Allen left the Tonight Show in 1957. For six months, NBC renamed and replaced its late night programming with a uh, multi-hosted, uh, multi-city-based talk show, which became a huge embarrassing failure. In need of a hit, the network soon returned to the uh, formula, uh, reviving The Tonight Show and hiring Jack Parr. When Jack Parr got there, uh, he brought in 10 to $15 million worth of advertising. How many of you ran home and watched American Bandstand? You did? Yeah, I did. Yes. You did? Yeah. Would you watch for the dancers or Dick Clark? Mm -hmm. Or the music? The music. And Dick Clark. And Dick Clark. How many of you had transistor radios that you hid under the pillow to listen to rock and roll music? Which was the music of the devil. <laughs> and internal damnation. So you're going to be internal. You're going to have damnation in the next life, according to the people who uh, who hated rock and roll. Anyway, there's Dick Clark. Uh, October 7, 1952, WFIL-TV, Channel 6 in Philadelphia, uh, a series, afternoon series, called Bandstand Debuts. The show would eventually become American Bandstand, and then we changed its emphasis to teens dancing to popular records instead of Eddie Fisher and uh, Tony Bennett, who in the late life became a rock and roller, right? Uh, on uh, July 23rd, 1956, No Fanfare, Channel 6, out of the blue, started to broadcast the show in color. Uh, the first bandstand was on for two and a half hours a day, from 2.30 to 5 in the afternoon. Uh, Dick Clark replaced Bob Horn as the host of Bandstand on July 6, 1956. Bob Horn had some problems. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and uh, he was accused of sexual uh, predatory behavior. Uh, and that's why Dick Clark took over the show. Uh, NBC, The Peacock, 
NBC full color television. That is Robert Sarnoff at uh, WNBQ Channel 5 in Chicago, flipping the switch from black and white to full color. It's April 15th, 1956. It's 4.15 in the afternoon. Uh, Sarnoff pushes a button and a new era of television starts. Uh, Channel 5 in uh, Chicago became the first all color TV station as uh, Wide Wide World, uh, that show, is carried to 110 NBC TV affiliated stations around the country. Remember that? Remember yes. that? Yeah. Remember, we had such a... New York. What? Which channel in New York? Channel 4. What, 4? Channel 4. Do you remember the, I mean, just, I mean, do you know how hard it was for us to watch TV? Think of it, think of it. You had to go and put the TV on, right? You had to put the TV on. You didn't have one of, uh, where is it? You didn't have this, right? You didn't have that at all. So you had to put the TV on, and then you went back to sit down because it took 30 minutes for the picture tube to come, 30 seconds for the picture tube to come on, right? Then it would come on, and the picture would be going like that, rolling, or going like that, and you had snow. Well, you had to uh, play around with the vertical and horizontal hole. And okay, you got to stop rolling, but you couldn't get rid of the snow because you had to play around with the rabbit ears, the antenna. And if you're watching with somebody else, one of the two of you would have to play around with the antenna. Mm -hmm. And you would do something like this. You'd get the antenna, and you'd be like that. <laughs> How's it look? Great, don't move. I can't stand like this. Don't move. You moved. Get back to where you were. Oh, okay. I can't move, but the picture is perfect now. It's absolutely perfect. I can't stand like this forever. And then the rabbit ears would break, and you have to put a coat hanger in there, right? And the tuna would break, so you'd have to get a pair of long nose, uh, long nose pliers until you replace the uh, tuna. The tuna. Uh, oh. That's why we're standing by. It's a picture of my wife at Disneyland. Wait a minute. What does my wife at Disneyland have to do with the early days of TV? 19, that's 40 years ago, Disneyland. Well, I had a lot, actually. Uh, Walt Disney, the mouse that roared, or the, the house the mouse built. Um, ABC TV, back in 1954, was a weak television network owned by Paramount. They had just 14 affiliates. CBS had 74, NBC had 71, Dumont was still in the picture. ABC was a real weak network. But ABC put up money to build Disneyland in Anaheim, California. And the deal was pretty simple. We'll give you a loan, you give us two TV shows, you give us a piece of the concessions, and we got a deal. And Walt, go down to um, the Orange Groves, 40 miles south of Los Angeles, Anaheim, Put it together. Uh, Walt gives them two shows. One is called Disneyland and the other, the Mickey Mouse Club. How many of you watched the Mickey Mouse Club? And quick, name all of the Mouseketeers because you can't. You probably know Annette, right? Some of you might know Don because he was on My Three Sons. Or some of you might know Tommy. But there was, of all the years I've been doing this talk, there was only one woman who knew the names of all the Mouseketeers. Uh, Disneyland and the Mickey Mouse Club uh, helped Disney, ABC, which is now owned by Disney, become profitable. Uh, ABC would eventually uh, buy Western and Detective series, like The Untouchables from Desi Lu. The Twilight Zone is also a Desi Lu sh uh, show. Do you know that Lucy was responsible for Twilight Zone? Do you know that? Oh, by the way, how many of you watch Jeopardy? Every night. Every, every night. night. Every night. Every night. 1983, yeah. Merv Griffin goes uh, yeah. out with Lucille Ball. Yeah. And they're having lunch, probably at the Beverly Hills Hilton that Merv owned. And Merv is saying, you know, bring back Jeopardy. But I have a problem because Art Fleming doesn't want to do, this, do the show anymore. Uh, but we're looking for somebody. I have no idea who I should have. Mm -hmm. Lucy looks at them and says, Alex Trebek. She was responsible for Alex Trebek. She was responsible for Rod Serling uh, because they put one of uh, his uh, scripts 
into the Westinghouse Desi Lu Playhouse. Um, CBS loved it and went directly to Rod Serling and said, put together a science fantasy show. And he did. And that show was on from 1959 to 1964. Could you have your show of shows on anymore? Yes or no? Or show like that? Yes or no? No. 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 Well, they're not around, but I'm talking about somebody who's, who could equal Sid Caesar and Emma Jean Coker today. But could you have a show like that today? Well, I'll tell you why you can't. Uh, this guy, I don't know, Mel Brooks. You ever hear of this guy, Mel Brooks? I heard his name was Mel Kim Melvin Kimmins. He's a writer. Did he ever do anything after your show shows, Mel Brooks? No, he didn't do anything, did he? Because I've never heard of Mel Brooks. Oh, yes, you did. Of course we did. Neil Simon, Danny Simon, Mel Tonkin, Lucille Kalin, Selma Diamond, Joseph Stein, Michael Stewart, Tony uh, Webster, Carl Reiner. They're the writers. They get more writers later on. Larry Gelbart and Woody Allen. The question is, how do you pay these people? Now, Carl Reiner said it is theoretically possible, while he was alive, that you could assemble a writing cast like that because, as he said, we were all young once and we wanted to do it. We needed the money. Uh, I know a guy by the name of Dennis who worked on the Carol Burnett show. And we were talking about four years ago about the Carol Burnett show. And he was telling me, you couldn't do that show today. I said, why? He said, she had 173 full-time employees. 173 what? Full-time employees. Mm -hmm. You could not, and that, that includes the writers and the actors and the actresses and everybody else. Mm -hmm. He said, you wouldn't have the money. You couldn't have the money to pay all of them. Mm -hmm. Nat King Cole. How many of you like Nat King Cole? Mm -hmm. Nat King Cole won't rock and roll, mm -hmm. except he did. Nat King Cole, rather interesting story. Uh, he was not the first African-American to host a TV show. Hazel Scott did. Billy Daniels did. Uh, Cole was a frequent guest on the uh, Your Show of Shows with Imogene Coca. NBC decided to put a show on starring Nat King Cole. And if you want good entertainment, you got a computer, go to YouTube, type in Nat King Cole, and you will see that show. It was a brilliant show. It was a great show. Uh, but the show had no national sponsors. There was Rheingold Beer in uh, New York and Hartford, Coca-Cola in Houston, Regal Beer in New Orleans, Gallo Wine, and Colgate Toothpaste in Los Angeles. And that was it. Why? Well, Madison Avenue wasn't ready to pay or to commit to having commercials on the Nat King Cole show because there was a civil rights problem in the South. Uh, the show ends December 17, 1957. Nat performs uh, the song The Party's Over, accompanied by a montage of uh, photographs featuring Cole and some of his guests, which included Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Harry Belafonte, Sammy Davis, and Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane's kind of interesting because Nat King Cole was told, you cannot have white guests on your show. And he said, they're my friends. He puts Frankie Lane on the show. It's up on YouTube. Watch it. It's hysterical. These two guys are having a blast. Well, they don't get the sponsors. Nat would pull the plug on the show because NBC couldn't afford to keep the show on on Tuesday nights. Uh, NBC, David uh, Sarnoff said, we'll, we'll put you on on Saturday. Nat said no. Uh, NBC uh, wanted the money from the singing, Singer Sewing Machine Company. And they wanted that spot that Nat was on with a Western called the Californians. Nat King Cole said, Madison Avenue is afraid of the dark. Hazel Scott. On uh, July 3rd, 1950, Hazel Scott became the first African Caribbean or African American, she was born in Trinidad, or person of a color to host a television show on the Dumont Network. Show comes to an abrupt end on September 29th, 1950. She's named in Red Channels, the pamphlet, that listed supposed communist sympathizers and entertainment. That happened on June 22nd. On September 22nd, she goes to Washington to say this is all wrong, but Dumont and the sponsors say, we've seen you, Hazel. That's it. Her association with Cafe Society, a suspected communist hangout, along with her civil rights efforts, made her a target of the House on Un-American Activities. She was neither a member of the Communist Party or a sympathizer. Uh, she requested to appear voluntarily before the committee. Her husband, 
the congressman, Adam Clayton. Al said, uh, don't go. It's going to ruin your career. She did. And that was it. Uh, there was the Bueller Show, uh, the first TV show to prominently feature a black character, Bueller. She was a maid serving a white suburban household. Uh, Bueller, the king of the kitchen, queen of the kitchen, dispensed uh, wisdom to the ever bumbling uh, Henderson family and her friend Oriole. Uh, three actresses played the title role, Ethel Waters, uh, and then she refused to go out west. Hattie McDaniel, who won an Academy Award, but she got sick, and then Louise Beavers uh, was the third. Uh, and there they are, the three viewers. Um, the uh, show, um, uh, Hattie McDaniel, only lasted six episodes. She fell ill. Um, Beulah came under attack from many critics, including the NAACP, which accused the show of supporting stereotypical depictions of black characters with Beulah uh, viewed as a stereotypical mammy, similar to Aunt Jemima. Same thing with the Amos and Andy show, except they had black actors playing the roles on the show, on TV, instead of white actors on radio. Uh, that was on between June 1951 and April 1953. There were 52 episodes sponsored by the Blatt's Brewery Company of Milwaukee. Uh, the NAACP didn't like the depictions of the characters and said to Blatt's, we're going to organize a boycott against you. Blatt said, well, we're not going to give you any more advertising support, and that was gone. The Goldbergs on TV. How many of you watched the Goldbergs or listened to the Goldbergs? There's Gertrude Berg with um, Philip Lowe. Uh, Gertrude Berg was the lead writer, star, producer, and the Goldbergs climbed in popularity. 1950, Gertrude Berg won the uh, first Emmy Award. Uh, and the Goldbergs, uh, were the show was nominated for Best Kinescope Show. She also had a clothing line for housewives, published a cookbook, wrote an advice column called Mama Talks. Her television show was made into a movie called Molly by Paramount Pictures with Berg on the set and in the editing room. She was the screenwriter and producer. But what goes up must come down. This is Aviva Klumper. Uh, she's from Detroit. She does documentaries. She did a documentary called Mrs. Goldberg, talking all about why the show failed in the end. Uh, it was because of Joe McCarthy and the communist scare. The House on Un American Activities published Red Channels, the report of communist influence in radio and television. Uh, Gertrude Berg's co-star, Philip Lowe, an active union organizer among actors, was listed in Red Channels. Uh, the sponsors pulled the support for the show. Gertrude is faced with a great dilemma. Find a new sponsor or fire Lowe. Uh, and she had great stage chemistry with him. Uh, she appealed to the sponsors, appealed to the network. Nothing was working. She wasn't firing Lowe. She even goes to Cardinal Francis Spellman, who said, yeah, I'll help you. But you've got to convert to Catholicism. She's Jewish. That's not happening. Uh, CBS had uh, employees taking loyalty oaths to the U.S. in 1950. Again, McCarthyism. Berg resisted network demands to fire Loeb. CBS and the sponsor General Foods canceled the Goldbergs in 1951. Uh, two years later, she comes back. There's you know, a new Mr. Goldberg, Harold Stone. It's on NBC. Uh, doesn't work. The sponsors are gone. The show goes to Dumont. Doesn't work. Um, blacklisting one. Oh, Gertrude Berg, she was blacklisted as well as a communist supporter through her association of Loeb. It ruined her career on TV. And there is Loeb, 1955, unable to work and support the schizophrenic son. Loeb commits suicide. Berg was left to uh, deal with her ruined career. Loeb checked himself into the Taft Hotel in Manhattan under a false name, took a fatal dose of sleeping pills. Hey, is Betty White photogenic or not? There she is, the Nine of Hearts. That is Betty White. That was her back around 1942, uh, or maybe earlier. After World War II, she makes the rounds to movie studios looking for work, but she's always turned down because she was not photogenic. Let me ask you a question. You had to watch Betty White over the years. Was she photogenic or not? Mm -hmm. So she took a radio job because you weren't going to see her. 
Uh, she made about five dollars a show. Sometimes she would sing. Sometimes she'd just make noises. Television was new and needed bodies and content. She took a job in 1949 on Los Angeles TV, a show that was on the air of th for 33 hours a week. That would lead to another show called Life with Elizabeth. Uh, Betty White was the most prolific female of 1950s television. She was constantly attacked by newspaper critics. Open war was declared on White with her safe, exuberant demeanor. And she, she was said to represent everything wrong with the medium. Uh, during the first decade of television, she was dismissed as too perky, too saccharine, and even vacant. I don't think Betty White was as uh, dull as a uh, burnt out light bulb, do you? No. Not at all. Here she is, she won an award. Mm -hmm. uh, Life with Elizabeth, her first TV show that wasn't a uh, talk show. Um, sketch involved White as a housewife named Elizabeth. It caught on, <coughs> turned into a half hour sitcom. Uh, the series pianist George Tibbetts began writing the sketches. Uh, studio producer Don Featherson, Tibbetts, and White formed a company called Bandy Productions, named after her dog, Bandit. Uh, she has a, another show on NBC. Uh, it's a daytime show following Arlene Francis, uh, who had a show called Home. And it's doing really well, except she runs into this Arthur Duncan problem. See, Arthur Duncan was a tap dancer later on with Lawrence Welk. But Betty White gave him his first break as a dancer on her show. Uh, somebody put this out last year, although it's on uh, Betty White's official Twitter feed. In 1954, Betty White was criticized after having Arthur Duncan, a black tap dancer, on her show. White said, I'm sorry, live with it. And she gave Duncan even more airtime. The show was soon canceled. Betty White in 2021 at the age of 91 said, what can I say? I'm a badass bitch. And uh, she said that uh, it's basically because of Jim Crow. Um, there was something going on in the South and they were unhappy with it. And uh, she said, live with it. NBC wouldn't live with it. Uh, it changed the t uh, show's time slots. There was lower viewership. By the end of the year, the Betty White show was gone. Betty White stuck to her guns, but Jim Crow won. I was not a big fan of the Donna Reed show. It never appealed to me, although one woman said, but they had Paul Peterson on the show. He was a heartthrob. I said, yeah, they might have had that, but I just never liked the show, except for this. Donna Reed wrote and produced some of the episodes. Uh, Lucy never wrote and produced the episode. Well, they, the company produced the episodes. But Donna Reed was like uh, Gertrude Burr. She wrote some of the episodes. Uh, 1950s women, they were supposed to be stay-at-home mothers. They were there to cook and clean. The father of the house made decisions, but not in the Donna Reed show. Uh, she expressed her desire to pursue her own career, and uh, she was an equal in the marriage. And she was the disciplinarian. The show ran for eight years from 58 to 66. Oh, the men had their shows. There were a lot of Westerns, all aimed at men. And there's James Gardner as a maverick. Some of the other shows, Playhouse 90, there were cowboys and Indian shows, Gary Moore, Art Link Leather, Soap Operas, Variety Show. Yeah, you know, maybe I need to fix the antenna. I don't know. Oh, that's why. How many of you remember the Dobie Gillis show? Maynard Gene Krebs. Beatnik. By the way, was there ever such a thing as a beatnik? No. It was a made-up word by Herb King uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle back in 1958. He was talking about there was a picture, it might have been Life magazine, of all these people laying around drunk. And he, uh, it was part of the Beat Generation. He just added Nick at the end after Sputnik. No such thing as a Beat Nick. The Many Lives of Dobie Gillis depicted elements of the 1959 counterculture of the Beat Generation. Maynard had a goatee, wore a ripped sweatshirt, has a love of jazz, and used the light vocabulary. Like uh, I'm talking to you now, like I'm talking. Uh, quiz shows, The Scandals, uh, 21. Anybody watch 21? Uh, Mr. Stemple, one of his relatives, uh, lives nearby my house. Uh, the, squ uh, the quiz show Scandals in the 1950s, uh, there were revelations that they weren't on the up and up. 
Uh, and Congress got involved in game shows that will have more regulatory rules and then new shows to assure, assure, assure their uh, legitimacy. That's Jack Barry, who is a uh, host of one of those shows. Uh, the Communications Act of 1934 prohibited the fixing of game shows, and Congress amended that in 1960. Hey, how many of you remember Barb Barker? Right? Truth or consequences of Barb Barker. Right. Yeah. This is Jeopardy. <laughs> okay. So this show comes out of the uh, quiz game. And Merv Griffin is putting together a show. He had hosted Play Your Hunch for Goodson Todman, and he wanted to break into producing shows after five years of hosting shows and filling in on To Tell the Truth and, and other shows. Uh, so he creates Jeopardy for the television network, uh, NBC, in 1964. But it isn't him. He doesn't come up with the idea. It's actually his wife, Julianne, who came up with the show's concept. They were flying from Minneapolis to New York. She said to Merv, give them the answers. Let them ask the questions. Uh, once the plane landed, Merv headed straight to NBC, where the news network executives bought the show on the spot, without a script or a plot. John Cameron Swayze was the first real TV anchor. Just look at the way he's dressed up, Carnation in the lapel and all that other stuff. The makers of Camel Cigarettes bring the world's latest news events right into your living room. Sit back, light up a camel, and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. R.J. Reynolds handed over its news production to NBC. The company chose uh, John Cameron Swayze. It began on February 19, 1949, 7.45 every evening. It pioneered the news format that is used today. Oh, censorship. NBC News couldn't show no smoking signs. Only one guy was permitted to smoke a cigar, Winston Churchill. And R.J. Reynolds said, don't do anything about the Korean War. Don't cover it. Edward R. Morrow. Um, he was asked to uh, host a weekly show, along with his associate, Fred Friendly. Uh, Morrow had been uh, producing a radio show called Hear It Now. The television show, See It Now. Television was in its infancy, and Morrow and Friendly had to learn the process of filmmaking and uh, primitive television equipment uh, of the job. Uh, I know Fred Friendly's widow, uh, Ruth, who's about 95, up until COVID, she was a regular teacher at Columbia University. See it now, uh, Morrow brings down Joe McCarthy. It's March 9th, 1954. There's a report on Senator Joseph McCarthy. See it now. Uh, Morrow wasn't allowed to use CBS money to promote the show or the CBS I logo. The show used McCarthy's own words against him. McCarthy demanded equal time. Got it. Stupid. Morrow eviscerates him on April 6, 1954. Uh, there was a lot of censorship over at CBS. Morrow had complained to Paley, who was running CBS, Bill Paley, uh, who founded the company in 1927. They could not continue to do the show if the network repeatedly provided equal time to subjects felt wronged by the program. By 1960, Morrow leaves. His last show, Harvest the Shame showing the plight of American migrant, uh, migrant agricultural workers. The only difference between now and then is that show is in black and white. 62 years later, that show holds up. The Kennedy-Nixon debate would change politics. It would become a show, a television show. Uh, it was done at WBBM in Chicago, Channel 2. Uh, TV would become a great political force because of visuals. Nixon looked terrible. Kennedy looked great. People thought that Kennedy uh, was a more serious person than Nixon. Some people watched the uh, debate and thought that and voted for Kennedy. And we leave with uh, Newt Minow, uh, who was the head of the Federal Communications Commission in 1961. The vast wasteland speech. Television and the public interest. Morrow said commercial television landscape was a vast wasteland and advocated instead for public service television. Minow success, successfully encouraged CBS, NBC, and ABC to expand news programs from 15 minutes to a half hour. He pushed for educational TV. Is this a vast wasteland? 
the family watching TV. Mino, you will see a, pro a procession of game shows, formula comedies, about totally unbelievable families, blood and thunder, mayhem, violence, sadism, murder, western bad men, western good men, uh, private eyes, gangsters, more violence and cartoons, and endlessly commercials, many screaming, cajoling, and offending. Most of all, most of all, bore them. Oh, true, you'll see a few things you will enjoy, but they will be very, very few. And if you think I exaggerate, I ask you, only try it. And we will leave it at that. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Any questions, any comments, the floor is all yours. Have anything to say?